something like that. All good. Yay. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks for waiting. I am going to share my screen. I'm actually really excited about this workshop for y'all. So let me. There we go. I am traveling, so you get to see the mobile version of this workshop. So that's what I see. Hello. Today, I'm very also excited about this because you are the first folks who get to see this workshop. So I'm going to uh, open source this repo for you in real time live on the on the workshop. It's got a lot of to do's in it and we're going to fill out those to do's together. So I'm going to paste the link to this workshop in the chat in just a moment. Oh boy. Don't worry, all my passwords are coded out. Here we go. Boop. This is the repo for the... Ah. Funny. Um, so this is the repo for the workshop. All the code that you're going to need to use is in that repo. It's got a very straightforward install step where in the readme, at the very top of it, there are two commands you're going to want to run first, npm, yeah, pardon me, npm i and npm run dev. So I'm going to let y'all clone and npm i that for just a minute here. And let me know if you can see in the chat the uh, the repo link, uh, and let me know if, if you get any issues installing that. Yeah, the <laughs> I am detecting a uh, bug in yeah bug in the uh, workshop software. So remove the spaces from that URL, and you are good to go. Just had empathy with y'all. I'm gonna rm dash rf my node modules. <laughs> Excuse me. And can install hopefully. So while this is running, oh, that was faster than I remember it being. This is a repo that uses Vite, which is a nice new bundler. If y'all haven't used it, it's similar to Webpack. It uses ES build to get you a nice, nice new uh, dev server here. I have in this repo a workshop set up. I created starter versions both with natives, just raw CSS, and then also in Tailwind. Uh, but we're just going to be using the native one today. The Tailwind is just a fun little reference I was playing around with. Uh, this is not Twitter. This is a very quick mock-up that I made that has quite a few bugs if you try to shrink the screen around. It doesn't actually work. It's dummy data. But uh, the, <laughs> the repo's purpose is that we're going to try to convert this dummy page over to using a design system in mid-flight. What I mean by that is we're going to, um, we're going to take a look at this in this workshop, and then over the course of the next few hours, we're going to convert it to what's called atomic design, which is a fantastic system that I really like for, um, for setting up a, a design system for a page based off of tokens, things like colors, basing typography, and then different components. Um, out of curiosity, I would love it if you all could let me know in the chat. Have you used Atomic Design before? Has anyone here 
please, uh, please just let me know what your personal history is. What have you seen or tried with atomic design? And I, I do mean just let me know in the chat while everyone is setting this up. If you have never used a tablet you design before, that is okay. So I, I'm, I, I'm. There we go. Fix the up. Fix the up. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna, just gonna keep, keep going, going here. here. I'm not wondering y'all has used it. So here is a great link that I'm gonna post in the chat. It's a blog post that I've used before to great effect. Uh, atomic design states that you design a system based off of these five areas of things, atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, pages, where an atom is your basic smallest unit of work. It's a component. It's your button. It's your text link, your anchor, or your, your colors. Uh, this has become really popular in industry because it lets you describe your site in terms of the intent of the page. A lot of people, when they implement a page, they go through and they implement everything in line as, as they see it. If they see an image, they'll implement, implement an image with the exact width, height, border radius, et cetera, the designs. But the problem with that is oftentimes the intent behind them is to share the images. Um, or share the intent between different components or elements. For example, if you have an image, maybe the intent is not that you specifically have a uh, 10 rem high and 10 rem high border, a wide party border radius 100% image. Maybe the intent is just that you have the same concept of a profile photo repeated on the page in a few different places. Circle here, circle there. Ooh, that's a bug. So with atomic design or, or similar systems, you split up your pages into the intent. And I actually prefer a slight variation on atomic design where um, I split things up into two main sections, tokens uh, and the components of the design. So we're going to start off with tokens first, where tokens are the core foundations of a design system. They are the fundamental building blocks that go into atoms. Colors, uh, spacing, typography, and so on. So in your dev server, go to do, 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 one dash tokens slash a dash colors. What's the link here? ASX, do, do, do. A, oh, pardon me, a dash color singular. And if you ever get lost, uh, there is a main.jsx file that has the um, core tokens all listed out. Oh, pardon me, the core roots all listed out in the app along with their components. Now you'll notice this, this page looks the exact same as native slash zero dash start, but 
on the inside, we have CSS variables set up for all the different colors of the page. So for example, the text links there, and I'll give you this one as a freebie, these are var color logo. So just as an exercise, um, I'd like y'all to, to post in the chat, looking at either of these identical pages, what are the common colors you see, such as blue, on the page that you think might want to be captured in the design system? Colors that are repeated a few times that we should make sure are understood so that if folks implement new versions of this page or other pages on the site, they would want to keep constant between those pages. Black, gray, good. While you do that, I'm actually video off for a brief moment. But specifically, which grays or how many grays do you see on the page? Well, just going through the page. Um, I'm going to take a quick round round. We have yep, black, yep, and black and white and blue. Sorry, I'm trying to. Figure out the deck out there. Great. Great. So yeah, we got so, a couple yeah, of different couple grays here. Different uh, here. Uh, let's see. Let's this see one, which is, one, which is whatever that whatever that text. There we go. There we go. Um, um, we have this yeah, what this seems, like, seems a like a medium gray, gray here, here, a light, light gray, gray as the background, the background, for these, background and then a darker gray. 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 For, for that stuff. That stuff. So, so you can you can, you can view the can answers view to all the answers things, all the things, things that I'm going to suggest on um, the GitHub repo. GitHub repo. Yeah. Chat form. Chat platform is really messing with it. Uh, I'd also suggest try viewing it on GitHub under Josh Goldberg, Design Systems Workshop, because on GitHub under docs slash and then the section and then the repo link, you can see it in this nice little spoiler tag here. So for example, the first, okay, the echo should be better now. Sorry about that, folks. There you go. So the first answers are here. Um, you can see it in these nice little spoiler tags on GitHub because that's a nicer way to, to try to answer the questions for yourself without spoiling it. Um, now it's tempting to go around and make CSS variables with the exact colors that we see. Um, if we were to go based off of what we've answered in the chat, there are actually four different grades on the page. And fun fact, one of them repeats itself in slightly different variations, F1 and F3. Um, but remember, the design system is intended to keep the intent of the variables. It's not that we have a specific black color that's used all over the place or a medium gray. The, the intent might change between different color schemes. If someone's viewing in dark mode, for example, the medium gray might still be gray medium, it might be a darker one, the black becomes white, the white becomes black, and so on. So oftentimes, when you're setting up CSS variables for your design system, you're going to use color names or property names that have somewhat more abstract or generic terms, color names like background or foreground. And this is a really powerful concept here, because if you haven't used CSS variables before, these things can be overridden in different uh, versions of your app and say media prefers color scheme dark, you might have a version of your variables that is say the dark scheme. 
where background is white or zero, 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 instead of FFF, black. Sorry, that's inverted, where it's black instead of white. So under the one dash token slash a dash color version of it, I've set up a few variables for you. And I'd encourage you now to actually go through the zero dash starts and, and try to set up these variables yourself. Um, so go to under, here, I'm just going to delete the tailwind folder, under source slash native slash zero dash start. There's an index.jsx file, which has this native zero start function in it. As a sibling to that file, you can go to index.module.css. Then you can set these up. So like color dash foreground and so on and so forth. Or if you want to be a little lazier, which I always like doing because laziness is fun, you can go to the answers here and copy and paste. Side view for reference. Here we go. So uh, I'm just going to quickly move that chat over. All right. So I've set these up. This is a very basic color scheme. If you have a more rich app, you probably have a few more colors. But one of the nice parts of My uh, app is crashing here. Why is it crashing? All right, because actually don't delete the tail end folder because V relies on it. Never mind that. Here we go. Impressive performance on the build system side. One of the one of the nice things about a design system is you'll find that a lot of apps have a lot fewer colors than you realized. Uh, Twitter only has maybe a half dozen unique colors, like six to 10 me, on most pages. So <laughs> I was a little surprised by that when I first started setting up this workshop. I just assumed they use more. Um, so that's a fun little tidbit there. But then also looking through the media first color scheme mode. Um, another fun tidbit is if you ever want to try out dark mode uh, on a page, uh, in your dev tools, which if you haven't used before, right click on a page and inspect. I'm using the uh, option command I shortcut to open on Mac. And then press command shift P on Mac or control shift P on Windows. Uh, you can then get this nice little command palette in your dev tools. And if you run prefers color scheme dark, emulate CSS prefers color scheme dark, click that. You get the dark version of the page, yay. So that is what the design system with colors version of the page looks like. And here is what the old version of the page looks like before I switched over to CSS variables. Oops. color scheme, dark, there we go. And there is no change in the page at all, even though it is in color mode. So immediately here, we're seeing the advantage of a proper setup design system, where if designers set up a dark mode color step for the page, and developers are implementing each component ad hoc with its own colors, where whenever they have a, say, a light gray, they specifically add in a light gray, medium, or dark gray in the CSS. They would then have to manually add Media prefers color scheme dark, and then figure out the um, the specific color for the component. Whatever. That's one point. And I'll pause here for any questions or comments because that is a stopping point that. Uh, I, I particularly enjoy. So any questions, comments, 
things y'all would like to talk about? Good question. How would you pick names if a particular component, say a button, has multiple colors in addition to the general layout? That's a great question. Thank you for asking, Glenn. Um, I try to go back to the intent of the designs. Um, let's say you have a button that has um, a focus state, which you can't really see too well in this one. It's got like a focus state blue, which I'm going to try to Try to make it a little more visible here. Say so yeah, a focus state blue, it's got its blue for the button itself, and then maybe like another one on it. Each of the each of the colors has an intent. For example, in this one, it's got the background blue and then also the outline blue. So I try to describe verbally, maybe even say out loud, what is the intent of that component? Um, is it that or pardon me, the intent of each of those colors. Is it that it's like an outline or is that a subtle emphasis? Um, some design systems that I've seen have a lot of different versions of primary, secondary, subtle emphasis, and so on. Um, and oftentimes what you'll see on a page is that the, the components are repeating slight variations of different colors. So oftentimes, although a component has six or seven colors, really there are only four or five colors that are actually supposed to be used in the design system. Um, let me know if that answers your question. I'll also say one of the design systems that I really like and go back to as a reference, which I'll post in the chat here, is Gamut, the Code Gamut design system. They have a slightly more complex setup than what we're dealing with here. But um, if you go to their colors page, they have a big Figma link at the beginning. Um, you'll see that they have a whole bunch of different colors, which actually do have names here. But the way they set it up is uh, really funny. They have this color mode uh, situation where, oh, maybe they removed it. That's really unfortunate. Where is it? Primary, here we go. Where um, even though they have all that huge, huge list of colors later, they also have like text accent, text disabled, feedback error, feedback success, and so on. So here's a nice little link for a more complex design system if you want to see something that folks use in production. Good question. Anything else y'all would like to ask? Is there a color that's only used just once? Um, like on this page, we don't really have any. Yeah, 
but let's say that like someone someone were to change the link to just like that thing. So like I don't know, okay, just for the It's often really tempting for folk designers and developers to take a look at the page and say, oh, I would like to add a splash color here because I think that would look better. Now, as tempting as it is, it's weird to have a color over show a puzzle. It happens all the time. But I would push back against that. And then both as a designer or developer, I would want to ask, well, what's the intent of the color here? What's the bad fact that some landscape might be behind the color? Uh, if it's only used once, maybe this should instead be switched to something in the design system. Maybe you should instead use this in the development. Or maybe you need to add the design system. So, um, if it's really a one up that actually makes sense on the feed, if it's like a marketing notice that's never used elsewhere, it's fine to just keep it as its own color. But if you have to How about now? Is this better? Cool. Um, yeah, I would say. Um, How about now? I love it. Well, uh, this is the best I can do, so I don't just might need to read your volume on the so sorry about that. Yeah, so, uh, Hey folks, I hope this is better for the audio because, oh, so bizarre. Okay, well, I guess we're not, I guess we're not using the setup I was using before. Okay, anyway, to finally finish answering the question, I would say yes, if something is only used once, then A, check, is it actually necessary? Should you use something from design? And B, if it really is something separate from the design system, then it's okay to just not use a CSS variable. But remember that one of the nice parts of a design system is you get the nicely described colors and other tokens, both for your light mode and dark mode and any other modes such as high contrast need to support. So strongly question whether a one of color is a good idea. Then I'm gonna keep this chat visible in the workshop. Yes, if there are too many one ofs, it might not be a great design system. It might be that people just aren't using the design system. And one thing that I don't cover too much here is soft processes on the team, like other workshops and presentations and pairings to get folks to use it. But I highly recommend if you're on a team that's not sticking to its design system, uh, consider doing a push to help educate folks and get them on board with it, because it is a wonderful thing to have and a terrible thing to waste. Cool. So while we're here, I'm going to switch up the progress so far so you have the notes I just took. 
what did I change? Don't want to keep that. Good push. All right, and again, you don't need to be playing around with this locally, but feel free to make changes in your zero dash start folder on your own. The next area that I want to cover is typography. Typography. Um, so typography is the text of your app, the font sizes, weights, line, heights, and so on. Um, it's mostly those three. You also sometimes get apps that play around with spacing or with um, like weird little kernings or text outlines. Um, it's generally good to standardize this in as few uh, variants as possible as with colors. So sound off in the chat. What do you see as different typographies in this app? For example, I see this area as being text that has just the regular form, the whatever I would call this medium size text here. And then it also has the anchor text there, which is pretty much the same thing, just a different color. So what do y'all see? And while you're Furiously typing away in the chat. I'll also note something I wanted to mention is that there's a difference between a semantic and visual description of text. Um, or text content. You might see something as a large heading or primary heading that is actually an H4 or H5 on the page. Just because something is visually large uh, doesn't mean it's semantically. Oops, that's a typo. Text sizes. Um, so taking a look at this page, you might think that it's reasonable to use like an H1 for these headings or an H2 where everything else is like H3 or lower. But there's a reason why we have these numbers in the HTML and it's not for the sizes. People who, um, people who use a, a screen reader or other assistive tools to navigate a page and also crawlers for Google's and other search engines, Google's search bots and crawlers and other search engines they care deeply about the structure of the page. For them, a heading two tends to describe that the heading is a second level heading, not that it is a particular medium to large size, font size. Um, so I encourage you when you're designing a web page, don't use the heading tag that gives you the font size closest to what you want. Use the heading tag that matches the semantic intent of the elements. For example, this, this page has an H1. And that H1 actually is the Twitter logo, which is over the entire top of the page. Because each page should have exactly one H1. It should be at pretty much the top of the page. Um, alternately, I could have put this as the H1. It's not super clear what exactly is the, the best one sometimes. But don't use, don't use an H1 just because it's the font size you need. I'm going to play around with the design of this page. Some, sometimes you'll see something like this, where uh, you see a like small bit of text that's above the, above the H1, or what seems to be the H1 for the page. So like here we have like details, set part top section and then later on we might have like a, a details section now visually it looks like this is like an h2 and then these are h1s but actually it's the inverse it's that this is an h1 describing the contents of the page and then these are h2s describing different sections of the pages top level sections so remember 
in your typography, the heading level does not always match its, its visual size. Cool. So just looking at the spoilers, I've seen four different font sizes here. I see a small, man, these visual bugs. I see a small, which is in like the pinned tweet or the, uh, the content here. We have a medium, which is used often on the page, a large, which is used sometimes, and then an extra like on the left nav, and then an extra large, which is I think just used for these headings. And then also just two font weights which kind of like the colors surprised me. I, I just assumed Twitter had much more variants, but they actually do a really good job of sticking to the design system. So again, I'd recommend doing this locally. You can copy and paste if you want. Um, go to your index module CSS and paste these in. Um, and then also, if you have the time and interest, you can go through and start changing up your values here. Um, so what I did for the colors, which I'll I'll do now a little late, a color MD is um, I went through and used the find and replace in my editor to switch values over. So I'm going to actually show you that now since the chat's a little empty. Um, the first color we can change is 000. On Mac it's Command Shift H to do to open the find and replace menu and Windows I always forget, control shift H maybe. Um, type in hash zero zero and so on. And in the include, do source native slash zero starts. Um, and you're gonna wanna exclude just that one file that contains your CSS modules and then replace hash zero, 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 zero with bar dash dash color dash background and apply. Now, if you do a find for var dash dash color background in your mod CSS modules, you'll see that, for example, the middle area dot link tweeter has been switched from color black to color var color background. You can keep going through the rest of your colors. And just to be sure, I'd recommend going back to zero start the page and refreshing just to make sure that your colors still match up. Look for a link tweeter in the do -do -do in the page. Image, Twitter. Here we go. We see that, yep, it's still got color black. It's still looks good. Yay. So let me know if any of that doesn't work for you. I'm just going to visually go through for y'all and first switch the colors and then also switch the typography over. Switching white over to var dash dash color dash foreground. Switching the two very light grays over from the original colors to color extra faint. There we go. Now we have color faint, color medium, Color emphasized, which is a really dark gray, almost black. And color logo, which is that lovely blue that we've all come to love with Twitter. And I'm going to remove the Twitter logo from the find results there. All right. That's the colors. Again, let me know if any of that doesn't work for you. You can always copy and paste from the folders in your source directory if you want to get a restart, like D dash typography can be just directly copy and pasted onto zero dash start. Moving on to typography, 
Here we go. So we can switch from font dash size 0 0.75 rem to font size bar dash dash size small. And medium is 0 0.875. A few matches there. Large. Extra large. Times old wait, not font size for this one. And line heights. Okay, and I'm gonna, oh dear, I switched something up. What did I do here? I messed up my final replace. That's unfortunate. Let's debug. Oh, you know what? I think I prefer color scheme dark still. Okay, Whew. there we go. Okay, I think I switched my blacks and whites in my zero start. Uh, that's really funny. So I'm just going to keep going because I actually kind of like how this looks. So don't follow me at home if you're, uh, if you're switching things around. But actually, this is a good opportunity to show if you do mess up something, that's totally OK. I'm going to completely reset all of my changes to zero dash start. And then copy and paste the typography version on top of it. So I just deleted my zero dash start folder, source native, and I copy pasted zero dash typography in its place. And now if I refresh the page, and you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and restart the dev server. It seems to be unhappy with me. Ah, you know what? It needs um, it needs fix ups for dash dash or dot dot slash images. So command shift L on Mac to multi select and then fixing up those image paths. So there's a bit of a penalty to, to restarting if you end up doing it. I'm just going to quickly do this. And let me know in the chat if any of this stuff isn't making sense or if you need any help with other things. I'm warming. I'll just restart. And you know what? For debugging a strategy, I'd say just go from the, the folder that you feel most aligns with where you are in the in the, the repo. So for me, I've just messed up. I'm giving up on restarting zero start. So I'm just going to go to native slash one dash tokens slash b dash typography. Here we go. All righty. Moving on. Next up, I'm going to docs typography, a new commit. So if you refresh the repo on GitHub, you should see the new notes. One tokens, 
see sizing. Sizing is a fun one. So um, sizing is the base margins, paddings, and common element sizes used in your app. These can be tricky. Sometimes a, um, sometimes a margin or padding isn't uh, exactly aligned to the design system because of technical needs. Try to try to keep an open mind here. Um, you don't always need to use an exact CSS variable if it's um, if it's just an implementation quirk. So what I mean by that is there are some parts of this page that are really clearly part of the design system for sizing. And for that, I'll give you one freebie and then ask uh, if you can spot any in the chat. One is that um, the this, this image size here is repeated a couple of times. Um, it's a 48 by 48 here and a 48 by 48 there. Um, other, other spacing measurements might not be so important. Like you could argue that this vertical padding here on this H2, which has a half rem for the top is maybe supposed to be part of the design system. Eh, it's hard to say. So waiting in the chat, what do y'all see as potential design system spacings that might be important to capture in CSS variables? I'm totally okay if y'all have nothing to say. up the notes in the meantime. Well, the answers that I have are, personally, I try to capture the things that I see happen in at least three or four elements. So on this page, that's border radiuses, circle images, their sizes, and then vaguely generally margins, paddings. Now for border radiuses, what I mean is if you look at, excuse me, these pill buttons here, which is kind of a colloquial industry term that I've grown accustomed to. It's a button that has just a border radius around the edges. There's a cute trick that this page that Twitter uses, which is border radius 9,999px. If you were to give border radius 100%, it would look like an oval or a circle but with some arbitrary large value like 9999, it instead gets this pill look where the edges are rounded, but you still have the nice flat on the top and bottom. Otherwise though, we have a border radius on the you might like, border radius on the what's happening, both of which are 0.75 rem. And I think we have the same amount on this little images grid up here the media grid, yep, 0.75 rem. And then we have these little embeds down here, which have, yep, the same amount. So in my code, I'd say there's a medium and then there's a full. And this is kind of the strategy that I wanna really emphasize here for, for going through a page and trying to understand the design system. You're trying to see what the common elements are, the common attributes, the common visual quirks that show up. Things like a border radius, which might be very similar or the same across multiple elements. As we saw with the colors, it's not always gonna be exactly the same. We had two very pale grays on this page before we standardized it. But um, oftentimes you'll see that there are things that are intended to be similar or reused across components. Like this border radius medium is what I'm gonna, I think, call it. So going through. Let's add to the native app, border radius medium, full. We also have circle sizes, which I'm gonna copy and paste over along with it. So I'm gonna set up my app to do, to start from one 
author one, tokens B slash typography, wherever you're starting from, that's okay too. Um, actually, let's just stick with zero to start, just keep it simple. Um, zero start index CSS. I'm going to copy these over. And voila, border radius, medium, circle size, and so on. So now if we find replace border radius 0 0.75 rem, swap it to border radius r dash dash border radius medium, and border radius 999, border radius far, border radius full. And also the border radius 100%, which you can just use 9004 as well, because it's going to be a circle anyway. Circle size is a fun one. Um, I see it on the page as showing up in these medium images too, which are, again, the 48px. I then also see these images showing up using that same size. Um, these icons, interestingly, also have a width and height of 1.5 rem, the same as these tiny icons, or pardon me, tiny profile images. So I'm going to standardize those as well. So let's say width 1.5 rem becomes width var dash dash circle size small, which might not be the best name for it. Arguably, you could say like icon size small or like the more general UI size small, but I'm going with circle size because that's what I put originally and I'm too, too stubborn to change it now. So just going through, changing both width and height from the hard coded values to the large values. And we just have one instance of the circle size large, but I liked it so much and it felt like such a natural thing to encodify that. For the question before, I, I actually am making a variable. Sometimes it is in the intent of the design that this is a standard thing. The only one element on the page that has this width and height of 10 rem is the profile image. So I'm just going to go with that. Circle size large. Okay. One last note um, on this one, spacing. Spacing can be tricky. Like I was saying before, sometimes you're not sure, it's not clear whether something is intended to be part of the design system or just is a coincidental design implementation. So I'm going to say now that although I'm replacing, <laughs> just to keep things quick, every, every, every unit of measurement that seems to match with one of the design system tokens for spacing, um, it's probably a better idea to go through and audit your code base if you're trying to switch over in place. Don't just switch every single instance of 0 0.5 rem over to your spacing small or equivalent, let's say. Um, go through and figure out what's actually supposed to be adhering to your design system. <laughs> in this case, I'll shout out a few places that to me feel like the intent is to have a standardized pattern, just for reference. Um, between these links on the left in this buttons area, it feels to me like the, like there should be like one and a half units of margin between them. This has margin bottom one rem and margin top 0.5 rem between each element. So that feels to me like a 1.5 rem unit of spacing that should probably be codified in the design system. Uh, the implementation though right now is not quite the same. If I were to redo these elements from scratch, I would probably do something like margin bottom 1.5 rem, margin top zero, and then the area like a padding top 0 0.5 rem. So we both pad it based on the design system and then also have an exact single unit of measurement between elements based on the design system. But for technical reasons, that's not always doable. Um, buttons themselves might need different amounts of padding or 
maybe there's just some weird reason why your CSS is hard to structure that way. So proceed with caution and don't always do at home what I'm doing. I'm just gonna replace 0 0.5 rem with var spacing small. Place one rem with var spacing medium. And large with spacing large. So that was a lot of occurrences. Quite a few dozen of them switched across there. Thank you for the thumbs up. By the way, workshops are tricky for, for me to give, for anyone to give remotely because it's hard to get a read on the room. So please let me know if things are making sense, if they're not making sense, if there are any questions you have. Um, I'll definitely leave a good amount of time at the end for general Q&A because we're covering so many topics. Uh, but anything you want to chat about or give a thumbs up for, please let me know. Makes me happy. Yay. Thanks, glad to hear it, both of you, appreciate it. <laughs> Made my morning. All right. So that's that's the three primary sections I have on the tokens. In actuality, they're gonna be probably a lot more tokens you have in your design system. Things that I haven't implemented here, like focus states or animations. One of my favorite things is a design system that codifies the transitions between states, like the timing or the animation used. Um, one of my favorite um, things to do when I'm designing a page, which is a thing that you never want me to do, I am not a good designer, is to put like transition 250 milliseconds just on everything. That's like this arbitrary constant that I've declared I like. So that like as stuff, uh, as stuff changes, you get like this nice little fade animation. I'll make these bold so it's easier to see. The color, var dash dash color. Logo. Let's just pretend that this is a hover state. Um, and it's good. It's good also to standardize those in your design system. And in fact, if we go back to canva.codecanva.com, let that load for a bit and. Let me just make sure, yes, I did push my changes. Um, in there, they, they call it foundations. Um, they have typography um, with one more really cool thing that I didn't want to bog down this repo with, but um, they, they have like an entire set of recommendations. A couple things I didn't want to bog down this, this repo with. One is they have a set of recommendations for like line length and alignment, which I think are really smart. And I'd recommend reading if you have time. Just fix the link there. Um, and also they have dedicated text um, elements, but um, I'm going to go into components next and did not want to bog down this repo with that. So just keep in mind that this, this Gamut site has a lot of documentation, if you read through it, that is only partially captured in this workshop. Um, another really good design system that you might have used before is Material UI. Or MUI, as they've... Wait, hang on a second. Hang on. That's a different thing. Material IO. Oh, man. I love this. This is, this is classic front-end space, where the... <laughs> There are multiple things with basically the same name. Uh, but Material, Material IO is also a very good design system. Um, it's got design uh, and then a color page that has theme meetings and palettes and all sorts of lovely pieces of documentation and principles for you. So would recommend. MUI, MUI, the one I showed for a second is also pretty good, but not what I wanted to show here. And also what I love is they have these beautiful visuals in material.io, uh, like primary, primary variants, secondary, secondary variants. So your color, color scheme for your app is probably going to include some colors that we haven't colored in the, covered in this workshop, such as error states and variants for like hover or focus state. Cool stuff. But all right. Whew. 
We've been here about an hour, which means it's time to move on to the second third of the workshop. I'm actually kind of pleased with how time has flowed here. Second third is two dash components. Um, components are components are the build building blocks that combine uh, add tokens into visuals. Um, they can be as small and simple as text links or buttons, or as big as a full tweet or page links. Uh, notes, components. Um, components are what the original Atomic Design blog post really focused on. Um, in theory, they describe atoms in this blog post as also including things like color palettes and animations and fonts. But in my mind, I see those as kind of a, a fundamental building block, like the, uh, what are they called? The, the protons and such uh, that go into atoms. My physics teacher in high school would be disappointed with me for taking a second there, uh, the electrons. But for me, atoms are the, the simplest building block visual components, things like labels, buttons, text inputs. Um, any, any design system is going to have a button component. That's like the quintessential one. So I'll give you that one as a freebie. That I see two common buttons on this page. The pill buttons that we see are the button in the left nav here, the tweet button. Then we also get the friends over on the right, the follow buttons. So based on your understanding of design systems, perhaps your previous experience, what do y'all see as the the atoms, the components that go into this page. Are there any others you'd like to, to call out in the chat? And while y'all might be trying, I'll also note the URL to keep going is two dash components. That has the, the answers in it, as does the GitHub repo. Yes, thank you, Glenn. Images and icons, definitely. Icons are a big one. Um, most design systems have a set of icons. Here we have home and like, what did I call this? I forget what I call this icon. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the like the link or hashtag icon. A lot of them will have like a calendar or and or location thing. Twitter's icon set is actually kind of cute. For your birthday, they have a little balloon one, which I always I always thought that was nifty. Um, and then the image component is huge. Um, a lot of modern frameworks like Next.js or Remix either ship with their own fancy image components or include recommendations for using like a community standard one. Here, I'm just going to focus on the profile photo component that we have on the page. There is a set of them, each of which has a border radius of the really big one, and not too much else on the styling, but the sizes are kind of consistent. So I'd say that like profile photo is a good one for us to have here. I'm also seeing I introduced a bug at some point where this one is very small, but should be bigger. And this is actually going to be a, uh, a point where I'm going to suggest you install, if you don't have it yet, the React Dev Tools. We're going to use them to debug in a few minutes. If you just look up React Dev Tools browser name, so like browser, or for me, it's whatever you're working on, and go and install that extension. I'll paste the link in the chat to the Chrome version. Um, and then also, I'll paste the Firefox version. If you're using Edge, I feel for you, but uh, I'm not going to paste the link because I'm on Chrome. LOL. Sorry, Microsoft. Actually, Chrome DevTools, is there a uh, Safari extension? OK, yeah, it exists. Good, good, good. Maybe. I've never used it before, Safari, to develop, except for specific bug fixes. So what do I know? Anyway. Just, yeah, you might want to get that, and then we'll use it in a few minutes to debug. But just looking at the answers I've set up, the 
Um, for our atoms, which are the fundamental smallest building blocks, I see content preview as being a common atom because I see that in a couple of places. We have it here with this. I don't know if you can see it in the stream, but this little link embed that has the border radius around it. We've got links themselves, which are blue. Um, we've got profile photos, buttons, and icons. Now, in theory, um, in theory, you, as I alluded to before, you could also have a text atom here that helps you standardize font sizes and line heights. So far, we've just been using CSS in our CSS modules for specifying font size and line height. And ideally, you would use a text component um, in the gamut design system, which I'll paste a link to in the chat here. They have their text element variants where you have an as prop that specifies what it is, and then a variance that specifies size. You can also do like font size and font family manually. That's ideal. However, I didn't want to take up time in this workshop going through and fixing up every single instance of text. So you can use Yamit or Material UI. I believe they have their own typography system still. Yep, yep. Um, ooh. Yeah, they, they have a whole a whole thing there. But for now, we're just gonna we're gonna skip that. Cool. Um, so the first one is content preview. Here we go. Um, I'm gonna show you the end result, content preview index JSX. This is a very standard component that you might see a similar structure for in a lot of design systems that use CSS modules and React. It takes in whatever amount of props you want to give it and then forwards them through to the internal anchor element. Um, later on when we convert to TypeScript, we'll see how this is actually like kind of annoying to understand conceptually and thus therefore in the type system. But for now, it's not too much code. Um, and I'm going to go to a component that uses it. Notice, by the way, I haven't actually dug too deep till now into the actual implementation of this, because we have a need to. But I'll show you the structure now, now that we're actually going through and replacing components in line. The page has three sections, a left nav, a middle area, and a right column. And if you use the React Dev Tools, you can go through and take a look at the structure interactively in the browser. The left nav has the buttons area. So I'm going to go to that real quick. Left nav, components, atom slash, oops, left nav, helps to spell. It's got the H1 with the Twitter logo. It's got a bunch of buttons that are mapped over. And then it's got a tweet button. This is the end state that we'll get to soon. And the profile photo and name and username at the bottom. In the middle, we have the middle area. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. It's got an H2 with your name and tweets, your profile banner, profile photo image, which we'll componentize. And in the contents, it's got a whole bunch of text describing you, blah, 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 profile details with your location and calendar and so on your stats, and then two tweets. It's got a pinned tweet and just a regular tweet. Two different components here, which we will, spoiler, eventually consolidate. So pinned tweet and then regular tweet. Um, and what I want to fix up here is this content preview area in the print tweet, because I see both of them use the same styles. And one of the nice things about the design system is that instead of having to re-implement something multiple times, you can share and reuse your code. So in my zero dash starts in tweets, I'm going to look at the original code here, your native. We have this, where is it? Do, do, do. We have this link here. So I'm going to show you on the left the pinned tweets 
in the original version, and then components, atoms, and tweets index.jsx. Here is what the design system ified version of it is. It's the same thing. It's actually almost the exact same code. But here we are switching to using a content preview component. That content preview component comes from our components directory. So I'm going to start setting that up now. Where I'm going to create a new directory components. And because I want to be able to export a whole bunch of things from that component directory, I'm going to say export star from dot slash content preview. And then I'm going to create that content preview. Content preview index.jsx. And I'm somewhat cheating because I have the code reference. So you can cheat too if you want to pick this out locally, which I would recommend. I'm using this utility class name, CX, that can my classes, styles from port function content preview, class name, dot, 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 props. And the reason why we are uh, taking the class name out from the props is because we want to combine it with styles.content preview. But otherwise, all the other props are getting forwarded, which includes any href and children and so on. And then in that index.module CSS, this gets to be the fun part of implementing atoms. When you're, when you're looking to convert a design system over in place, um, you have to ask yourself, what are the atoms that, or what are the components' unique properties, and what are the components' shared properties? In this case, the shared properties that I really care about for this content preview link are the border radius, the border itself, and I'm thinking the padding inside of it. We can see that it's got a var spacing medium as its padding on bottom left top. And you know what? We can probably, probably just go ahead and use that for the padding everywhere in the component. So I'm going to say dot content preview has padding r dash dash spacing medium. Although I will say, I think in the implementation, I didn't actually give it the, uh, the padding. Oh, you know what? I don't know why this isn't showing up here, but there is supposed to be <laughs> an image there that loads. Image dead? OK, the image is dead by now. Uh, that's funny. So I'm just going to go to Twitter and get a URL for the first embed image that I see. Here we go. Uh, don't last. Huh. How did I store that image? I'm fascinated by this. Aha, here we go. Thank you, Brittany Joyner, who is, by the way, a great person to follow. Um, just going to go over, pins, tweets, middle area, so start, middle area. Where is that pins, tweets? Here we go, and I'm just going to this with it. You can find and replace with whatever image you, you want locally. Now when we go back, here we go. So there's actually no padding we want to switch over. So that's cool. Um, so we really just want to copy over that content preview has border radius of bar dash at border radius medium and border 1px solid bar dash dash color faint. And then I will also note that because it is being displayed as a block element, and A or anchor elements are default inline or inline block. I always forget. Display block. There we go. We have made our first design system component. It is a content preview component. It is seven lines plus five lines of code. And it's exported from um, components slash, oops, I put that in the wrong directory. That's fun. Zero start slash components. 
slash index. Now, in theory, you could skip this index.js file and have people import directly from component slash content preview, but in my experience, that's real annoying. So we're sticking with the index file. And then in our pinned tweets index, we can import content preview from dot dot slash dot dot slash components. In theory, if you're building a design system, you might have like an NPM package set up, but that's not covered here. And I'm just going to switch this over. Now, here comes my favorite part, the leading code. Because we are using the design systems version of this content preview, we can find the dot link and remove any styles that are shared between the two, meaning border radius, border, and display. Funny enough, just alphabetically, which is how I normally sort my CSS, fight me, there are the first half getting removed here. Shout out in the chat if any, shout out in the chat if anyone else sorts their CSS alphabetically, or if you have your own strategies you feel strongly about. Yay. So this is good. We have deleted code. Deleted code is always a happy moment, even if it's code that we re-implemented or copied and pasted or cut and pasted elsewhere. And now I'm going to go do the same thing in the other, the tweet components. I'm going to import content preview. Go to styles.link. Use the content preview here. Now that I've used the content preview here, I can delete the duplicated dot link styles. Pardon me. Okay. So that is our first design system components. Yay. Woo. And I'm going to go ahead and push up. Refresh your github.com previews if you need. Yay, thank you, Glenn. All right. Our next component, and actually before I go on, I'll just say again, this, this is going to get more and more code heavy as we go on. Um, please let me know if you want me to slow down or speed up if I'm just taking way too long for you. Love it. All right, so our next components are atoms.md file. Our next thing is link. And this one has a fun little prop shenanigan here. Um, ooh, actually, you know what? I think I removed that. So I'm just going to go to middle nav, middle area again under native zero starts. Gonna, gonna say that uh, this styles.anchor gets repeated a whole bunch of times. And this is actually a really good indication that if you see something repeated a whole bunch of times, you probably want to repeat it in your design system only once and then reuse that thing. So if we have styles.anchor, which in the corresponding CSS is, what is it, just the color? It's generally a good idea to have a unified link or anchor or whatever you want to call a component in your design system. Um, what I'm going to do is components JSX. I'm just going to call it um, link here because that's kind of the standard thing. One second. So components, I'm going to copy and paste my content preview because <laughs> excuse me, every good developer copy and paste like a maniac. And I'm just going to dot link instead of, I call it links by accident, dot link instead of um, whatever it was, content preview, and call link here. 
and it's actually basically the same. Let me just make sure I'm not uh, getting something here. There you go. Um, and the only difference in styles here is that um, we are giving it this nice color, which our dash dash color logo is the actual way to go. And we can delete the old dot anchor styles because we are just completely switching on over to link. So I'm going to do a lovely bit of multi-select. On my Mac, it's Command Shift L to select all. I think on Windows, it's Command Shift D. I, it's been a while, so uh, let me know if I'm wrong there and it's something else. I'm sorry, Control Shift L, not Command Shift D. But control Shift L on Windows, Command Shift L on Mac. Ultimately, Command D, or I think Control D, lets you select just the next instance of your selection. So if you press Command D a bunch of times, it selects as many as you want. And, uh, Replace a class name equals styles anchor with just link. And then I'm going to do the same thing with slash a to link. At the very top, I'm going to import link from dot dot slash components. Now I've got a little, I don't know if you can see it in the share, I've got a little red anger here thing there. And that's because there is a link that had for some reason, not a match. I think it was on the next line or something. So A, oh, it didn't have a class name. That's unfortunate. So I'm going to call that a link also. And then this, this yep, matched on the next line. So I'm going to call that a link manually too. I love VS Code and general editor shortcuts. I think they're the best way to be a productive developer. One of the best ways is to just keep keep using shortcuts to automate the boring stuff. Back to the workshop. Uh, we have this, which is ooh, got some weird CSS stuff going on. I don't know why V decided to repeat the link styles so often, but if we look at the component, we see a whole bunch of links now. And if you were in a real big kid production ready design system, you would probably also have like text and other similar typography primitives all over the place, which makes the more complicated React tree, but makes it so much nicer for standardizing font sizes and so on. So in theory, we can go through and place replace links in the rest of the page. Um, in practice, I think it's only going to be one, the show more, so I don't mind just doing that now. But in a complicated page, you might end up having to file to-do tasks to go through and switch a bunch of stuff over because it can take a while to switch everything on a page or a complicated website over to a design system, and that's OK. Um, yeah, I'm just going to skip the show more for now, just for the interest of time, because I want to move on to the next thing, which is profile photo. Adding notes up here. The so profile photo has the first example in our design system of a variant prop, meaning a prop that changes the general uh, visual aspect of the component between one of several known things. We have, I think, one, two, three different sizes for the profile photo, though I, I might be misremembering, might be four. Uh, we have a, a small one, which we see here in the followed by area and in the link preview. We have a medium, which shows up in the posts and the suggested follows. And we have the large, which is the top one on the page profile photo. So I'm going to, in our components, make another new one, profile photo, and export it from the root components index. Oh, 
photo. Do, do, do. File photo. I'm going to give it a size prop. And it doesn't actually take all that many other props. Pardon me, it doesn't specify all that many other props of its own because profile photos have different sources and maybe different alt texts. So there's not that much extra we have to add to it. But what I do want to specify is that we need, do want to add in sizes. I'm going to say small styles.size, small, medium, which is styles.size medium and large, which is styles.size large. I just remember off the top of my head, border radius is r dash is border radius full um, size small. Wrong shortcut there. Small, medium. And we'll fill those out by looking at the page in a second. Now, you might be looking at this and thinking, Josh, I can be clever here. I could do something like styles of size and then like size 0.2 upper case plus size dot slice 1 to get dynamically the size from the index module CSS. To this, I would respond, oh my god, please please don't do that. That, that works, and it's clever. I applaud you, your, your craftiness, your tenacity. But this makes it really hard to statically analyze your code and figure out which class names are used or not used. Um, as a general rule of thumb, that has been quoted by many people before me, and I forget the quote name of. Um, you should be able to search or grep that's the other common tool through your code base quickly. And if you want to find where something is used, you should be able to search for its name. If I want to see where size medium is used, I want to see, here we go. I want to like be able to search it and then get the exact place it's used. And this shenanigan here is not super deep or grepable, as they say, or searchable. So then you might say, well, instead of using this shenanigan with the string concatenation, what if I do like sizes of size so that it's not a string concatenation? And then people who pass in say size equals medium would still be able to find it. And I say, yeah, that's better, but it's still not greppable, meaning grep, the tool that searches, wouldn't be able to find it. So even though it's a little extra code, I personally prefer and recommend um, sizes of size, like an object like this. It lets you quickly map between the CSS class name and the place it's used in code. Your mileage may vary, as they say, why MMV? If you really prefer one of these other two strategies, I don't agree with you, but I respect your decision and freedom to do that. It's, it's not the end of the world if we disagree. So without all that in the way, with that out of the way, let us figure out what are the sizes we actually need here. I see this big one is within height uh, circle size large. So I'm going to move that over here with circle size large and height. By the way, if you missed it, I just pasted and then duplicated the line. Uh, to duplicate the line, the shortcut I use is command C, command V, uh, or on Windows control C, control V. If you just have an empty selection on a line, copying, copy the line and pasting duplicates the line. Yay. And spoiler alert, I'm pretty sure for my recollection, it's circle size medium for medium and circle size small for small. So using that command B or control B shortcut that I mentioned earlier, I'm multi-selecting once on each of them to switch it over. All right. Now we can go through and start replacing instances of profile photo in our code. Zero starts, middle area index, 
first thing that we find is this big friend here, profile photo. And I want to shout out something cool in the editor. You don't have to be using VS Code. Apologies for not remembering to mention at the beginning. You can use whatever editor or text situation thing you want. But I really like VS Code and similar IDEs because they come with TypeScript integrations, which even in your JavaScript file give you really nice auto completions. I typed in profile photo with a typo here with a capital H by accident, but it is still suggesting that I use profile photo from dot dot slash components. Yay, refactoring tools. And I'm going to add a size equals large here. And now that we're using the profile photo component, style switch, I'll move to the bottom of this page's styles. We can get rid of duplicate ones. So banner image. Um, oh, wait, shoot. <laughs> I got the wrong one. I got the banner image, not the one just below it, profile photo. Here we go. Profile image has a border radius and a height and a width that we can remove. Now, interestingly, it also has a border, which, oh, lardy, that's too big. What did I do here? I forgot to add a size equals large. Here we go. Nice. It also has a border radius, um, which you can keep separate. You don't have to move everything, every single style under the sun to the design system. Uh, but I'm actually going to move that border radius into the design system also, because I see down here, it's a little hard, so I'll, hard to see, so I'll zoom in. These tiny little profile photos of my stupid smug filing, smiling face are also given that border radius treatment. VS Code for the win. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, so I'm just going to move that over. Um, now, to start, I'm going to give it a uh, r dash dash color. I don't know what it was. What's the? Yeah. Um, but as we'll quickly see, 4px border radius doesn't actually work for everyone. So just, just to play around, I'm going to switch these over in place, followed by, here we go, profile photo. Size equals small. These are profile follower image. So here we see that these actually have a border 1px solid. So we can move that over to the specific sizes um, just to not have to duplicate code. I also want to note that uh, speaking of duplicate code, we have the duplicate solid and color. So I'm actually going to move these into their own declaration here, border style solid and border color var dash dash color backgrounds. So we can just do like border width on each of these. I think actually what I could have done is border solid var. Let's see if that works. All right, we got the border radius and everything set up here with a nice 4px border. And then, yep, the 1px border down there. Very nice. This makes me happy. However, I've actually introduced a very small discrepancy in the original design system, um, or pardon me, the original page implementation of that bug, I'm going to switch the Tailwind and start version as a clear slate. Um, I don't believe these images actually used a border. So we might see a bug pop up where there might be an extra white border around these, which we might have to get rid of. So let's do that now. So start right column. Uh, let's do to do. Where, here we go, image, might like image. Let's use profile photo for these two. And then the size is medium. 
Here we go, yeah. In our new version, there is a white border radius. In the original, there was not. I can't have that discrepancy. It might not be super visible in the workshop stream, but I promise you there's a small border radius of something like 2px around these images. Um, now, I didn't actually specify a border width in the styles. And in fact, our page doesn't have any size medium profile photos with a border width. So a couple of notes on that. One, um, it is very doable, very plausible that in implementing a design system, you may find that there are combinations that don't exist on your page, your app. Combinations that you just have to guess at or leave unimplemented for someone else to implement as they need them in the future. In this case, I'm just going to guess that the border width here is like 2px. It doesn't matter because we don't need it. But um, if you're if you're a designer and you need to make up a combination, it's OK to either leave something unimplemented or undesigned with just a note of, hey, if you need this combination, let us know. We can make it for you. And if you're a developer and you find a combination that you might think you need to implement, but you're not sure and there are no designs for it, just ask your designers, hey, what is the combo supposed to be here? Maybe this was actually 3px, or maybe the design system says you should never have a medium profile photo with a border radius. Who knows? So always, always feel free to, to ask if you're a developer what are the intents of the designs. The second thing is um, this is a second variant that we're going to have to to account for. So I'm going to add another prop here, bordered. Um, we're going to do bordered and styles.bordered. So we're only going to have bordered class name be the thing that specifies order width here. So dot size small, bordered size small has a width of 1px. This is getting all weird. Border of size medium is going to have, say, arbitrarily the 2px. And then bordered size large is 4px. Funny enough, we don't have any styles on the profile photo, which is weird. I thought it was, oh, right, it's border radius. Oops. There we go. So profile photo's only native style that is always applied is that it has a border radius. Otherwise, we have a style and then optionally, we can specify that it has a, a white border or a color background border around it, which becomes black and dark mode. Cool. So now we have to fix our profile photo to be bordered in the middle area because now I removed it and <laughs> designs are off. So bordered and bordered up here. There we go. And that's fixed. Hey, we have not just implemented a few design system components at this point. We have also implemented a design system component that has a couple of props, variant props, as some folks in the industry call them. Now, it's um, we've been here for within the components section about 40 to 50 minutes. So I'm going to go over just a few more components. So if you have any questions on components, feel free to ask them now or in, in 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, I'm going to switch over to the last parts, which are TypeScript and documenting with Storybook, let's say in 15 or so minutes. So any questions you all have or comments, please please feel free to mention in the chat. Um, but for now, I'm going to go over to the next component, Adam. Um, oh, apologies. I said over to the next section. I said TypeScript. What I meant is the next section of tokens. Uh, pardon me, uh, components, which is molecules, which are combinations of atoms. The next thing, the next atom component, so the small foundational component to build, is the button. And again, we have another situation with two variants here. Um, I'll actually fix the notes here. Portal bordered is also bordered. False tree. Um, we have. This black background, so the 
foreground color. And then we also have this blue background, the logo blue. We And crossing that as a two by two grid, we also have small size or medium size, I would call that. It's not really small. And then large size for the button. This is another example of not all variations of the component are implemented. We don't have a primary button is what I'd call this main one that's got the black background, nor do we have the smaller size button with the blue background. And that's okay. We can make a guess as the implementers. All right, going to our components. Let's add that button. I'm gonna take profile photo, call it button and open both these. By the way, the shortcut I used to open them is I've been using command shift E to when focused on a file, open it in the file explorer to focus on it, and then up and down to move with my keyboard and mouse and space to open a file. Good stuff. Add the ducks. All right. So, button, I'm just going to clear all these styles and oops, call this the button component. A button doesn't have bordered. It has, I'm going to call this color for its color. So, I'm going to add const colors equals. And I actually forget what I call them. I'm thinking probably primary and secondary are good names for the button. Yeah, primary and secondary. <laughs> styles.color primary, secondary, styles.color secondary. And uh, colors, color in the class names and mix. Very good. Primary and secondary are really nice semantic names which similar to how we were calling things like color logo instead of color blue, help capture the intent of the color. The intent is that it is a primary button. It's the most important. It's the call to action, the thing that you're trying to draw a user towards, not just it's blue. It's a key semantic difference there. And things are broken because I haven't saved what I, what I miss up here. There we go. We don't have any styles implemented yet left. Let's go to our uh, left nav because we don't have styles yet. Words are hard. First one in left nav is this tweet button. Oh, right, because our button is a button. I should switch that from button. I'm going to the styles for tweet button. Bring these here to be nicely arranged dot tweet button you see color for both of them is the color background so we'll do that um a good rule of uh guidance rule of thumb to go by is um margins tend to be styles that are added to components by their users by the components that use them um Whereas padding is internal to the design system. Padding is inside the element, how much padding do we need? So I'm gonna say that this is a, what would I call this? Uh, let's say a medium button, a size medium. Size medium has this amount of padding and then color primary has this color bar dash dash color logo. Um, and then also font weight and border radius are common to all instances of that button. Just to show that I'm actually changing things, I'm going to look at what happens if I remove the common styles from the button. It looks like just text on the page. And then if we switch this over to our fancy schmancy button from, sometimes the autocomplete gets it wrong, from components. Import button from dot dot slash components. And then look at it again. Well, 
why isn't it working? Ah, I forgot to switch over the class name. File stop button. Ah, almost. It's not the font weight bold, but not the color. So I think I forgot. Yep, I forgot the size and color prompt. So let's say color equals primary. By the way, you'll see later in the workshop how we can help enforce the proper colors because, or pardon me, the proper props, because it's very easy to forget to add a required prop, as you just saw. And the way we're going to do that is with TypeScript. Excited about that. Oops, looks like in my implementation I swapped the colors, so let me fix that. Uh, it's background, color backgrounds, not color, color background. Um, background color logo. There we go. And we are, oh, whoops, this was size large, not size medium. Doing great this morning, folks, or evening for you. Afternoon. All right. Um, there we go. Now our button is nice and big. And in fact, this isn't in the other parts of the workshop, but one nice little trick for buttons is to add user select none. That's just a nice little treatment there. It makes it feel like more of a button. And in fact, you could add even more styles. You could add like hover states and stuff like that. But for now, I'm just going to leave it as just user select none for the sake of time. OK. Button has user select none. It's got size large. Now let's add in the other one, right column. Uh, follow buttons here. Button. Here we go. Adding components. And that's color oops, color equals secondary, size equals medium. Yes. So user select, so I know this is using the new button. Yay. Okay, dokie. Um, let us continue. So we've, we've implemented buttons, and this feels to me less exciting because we've already implemented a few components. So moving on, on Adam, the last thing to implement is icon. And I got to warn you, this one is actually pretty meaty, and I'm not going to want to spend the time to go over the entire icon. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes on this. And I say it's meaty because there are a bajillion different icons to implement. There's pin icon, likes, share, home, link, calendar, balloon, and so on. But I want to go over the concept of icons. Um, and I want to give one huge important tip here of don't have a mega icon component. And what I mean by that is when you're implementing your, your, your button, it's really tempting to have a prop similar to what we've had with like colors and sizes on these as your, um, your which icon to show. I might do something like, um, I don't know, what, 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 what does one call the icon of an icon? Maybe let's call it um, visual. You might have like link and balloon, where you might like import link from icons link.svg and import balloon from icons balloon.svg. And then you might repeat that a bajillion times for all the different other visuals in your design system that have icons. The problem with this is as you get bigger and bigger in your design system, which may for many sites end up including dozens or even hundreds of icons, because you're importing these statically, meaning always, no matter what, in your component file, those are always going to be loaded on every single page. You're going to have dozens or even hundreds of different SVGs loaded onto the page, which can get kind of intense for performance, intense in a very bad way. So instead of having a giant object or mega icon visuals object, instead, what I recommend doing is having a base icon that can then be used within other icon components. So I'm going to cheat a little bit for the sake of time. And um, copy and paste. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to export function icon. 
an icon, the component is actually really small. It just takes in a class name and the size along with the other props. And then it really just uses the size to implement its own styles on top of the very basic icon styles. At, there aren't even any dot icon styles here. So we could have just said CX sizes icon and removed the class name or like styles dot altogether outside the icon. Um, and then we also have tiny. So I guess <laughs> we don't have a large icon yet. So we just have tiny and small and medium. All right, so this is your icon component. And the way folks would use it is by implementing an individual component for each possible icon. For example, you might have a pin icon or a messages icon. And each of these will render your icon components with some children. Just by coincidence, I think they all have G as a child and then one or two paths. You don't have to know SVGs to implement a design system. Just know that SVG has a whole bunch of different children that are a lot more succinct than uh, I find readable personally. So that's how one might implement an icon. And I would, I would strongly recommend have performance as a top of mind thing when implementing icons or similar uh, variant UIs in your design system. Just to show how this might be used, if, oops, if we do a search for pin icon, we can see, let's, here we go. We can see it used in this way. Let me let me find it in uh, source native slash two star. Here you go. Here's an example where it's used very similarly to any other component in icon, and then it calls to the base icon component for your icon styling and sizing. So again, performance is critical. So please, please don't have a mega icon component. Another thing to keep in mind is the colors of the icon. Um, you may have spotted a bug real quickly that I actually didn't call out at the time when we looked at dark mode, preferred color scheme dark. Um, let's go to, well, this is native zero start, which barely works. So I'm going to go to native slash one tokens photography, let's say, like an earlier version of this that has the Let's go to one token C sizing and then color scheme prefers dark. Um, you may have noticed that some of the icons worked. Actually, I think maybe just the one, maybe just pin icon worked. Oh dear, looks like this is a bug. Uh, and then some of them didn't. Some of them still used the same color as before. And the reason for that is an annoying quirk of how SVGs work in the browser. SVGs are able to specify current color as their fill. You may notice a prop on some of the paths in the SVGs, fill equals current color. That calls up to the CSS to take the color from the, uh, the, the, the text color of the parent. So in this case, it's color media, let's say. But when you have an image, it does not have the ability to take current color, which is quite annoying. Now, there are two ways that you can typically solve this with your SVGs. One is you can have it take in a color prop and then use some like CSS trans translate or transform or whatever it is to skew the color of the image if such a thing is supported. Or you can use inline SVGs, meaning SVGs that are printed out into your DOM, which is what a lot of websites use, and then use fill equals current color in there. And one of the nice things about having a design system implemented in this way with a base icon component is that you can use that base icon component to force everyone to do something the same way as you. In this case, the SVG strategy here is used, so everyone is able to use fill equals current color. There are no .svg files floating around in your implementation. Everyone is now using function components. So Yay, standardization. And again, because there are a bajillion different components we might want to go through and implement, I'm not going to go through and implement them all. I'll just show you that 
um, I made a subfolder icons that has all the icons in it and exported everything from them, balloons through share. And then in the root level components index, I exported all from icon icons. Interestingly, I did not export the base icon components, the one that renders the SVG. I just forced people to use sub icons. All right. So that's all the time that I wanted to spend on atoms. And um, now I'm going to move over to molecules, unless anyone has any questions in the chat about atoms. I do prefer light here. I'm curious why this one is a uh... ah, tweeter name, it's still using black. Missed that in the final replaces. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate you. All right. Atoms are the oops, docs icon. Atoms are the core building block of your block components. They're the smallest unit of components. They can't be broken down at all. So an atom would be something like um, a button, uh, a link, stuff like that. As the name suggests, molecules, molecules are combinations of atoms. They are still small, low level components, oftentimes, or they're oftentimes still small, low components. They don't have to be. They don't have to be. They can be larger. Um, so there are two molecules that I've identified in this design. One is the concept of a tweet, because the tweet combines icon, profile photo, text, link, embed icon, and so on. And arguably, a, a tweet could be considered the next level up. It could be considered a template. Um, this template, right? I always forget what comes after. Sorry, an organism. <laughs> a tweet could be considered an organism. But in this case, I think because we don't have any other organisms in the design, I'm not going to bog down timing with that. The other one is this friend on the right here, this right sidebar heading with content thing. I'm going to start with that because it's quite a bit simpler than the tweets. Both of these have a lot of the same styles. They have a border radius um, of an area that has this very faint or light gray background. And then they have this super duper bold heading in the top left of it with some padding around the contents. So similar to how we implemented atoms before, we're going to go ahead and implement this molecule in our design system. So first up, suggested contents. Now, as you get higher and higher in your stack, I will note, um, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to get pushed the changes to native. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I'll undo that later. Um, as you get higher and higher, the names might get a little less small, a little more verbose. Uh, suggested content, tweet, profile timeline view, but that's OK. We're getting to bigger and bigger components, so it's natural that sometimes the names get bigger and bigger and more fancy sounding. So looking at suggested content, I'm going to go to my components again, suggested content, copy and paste my one of my simple components. I'm just going to copy and paste link. Here we go. All right, div, which has styles.suggested content. And then we also, interestingly, have a heading here. So we can no longer just spread props to merge the children on over. We're also going to need to explicitly have our children prop. Slash div, 
h2 class name equals styles at heading, let's just say, and then also whatever children are there. That CSS doesn't have slash slash comments at all. So let's look at the right nav to try to figure out, or rather right column it's called, figure out what are the styles that we need. The first instance of what will be refactored to use this molecule is what's happening. Styles dot what's happening, oop, dot what's happening. Let me just take a look here. We have background color, border radius, font size, line height, margin cop should probably stay because that's outside of the component, but padding will be moved over. Background colors, bar, dash, dash, color, paint. Border radius, font size, line height, padding, all good. And then the heading for it, which is this what's happening heading, we do care about font size, weight, and line height. And you know what? We care about everything. So let's just move that over. Great. So we can say what our suggested content, getting it from components, and then add in the heading prop of what's happening. Voila, we get to delete that H2 element that was in the code. Great. And just checking here, back to our native zero starts. If we look at the right column, suggested contents. In fact, you can search by name in the React Dev Tools under the components view. Here we go. Yep. Suggested contents. Oh, I did the second one first. Oops. And you know what? It looks like the color is off on the background. That's unfortunate. I might have messed up the background color here. So let, let me go to the, the index styles. It's, what was the color? Extra faint. What did I call it? Oops. There we go. That's better. I'm realizing now that I used extra faint in camel case instead of kebab case. So capital F instead of a dash F. In theory, it's good to standardize. I'd recommend using the kebab case always. So shame on me for forgetting this, but it's a live workshop and I'm just pleased that like the internet hasn't crashed or anything, not to jinx it. All right. So I'm going to continue and go to the first of the two, second to be implemented, you might like, which is, here we go, dot you might like, and you might like heading. You can delete that heading similarly. And you know what? These have basically the same style, which is our set of styles, which is a good indication that we should separate it out into a component anyway. So heading equals you might like, and if becomes suggested content. Okay, dokie. Here we go. Yep, there it is. Suggested content. Great. So we have implemented and used our first molecule in our design system. Yay. Good stuff. Let me know. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, I definitely definitely copy and pasted these trending headlines from uh, real things on Twitter, which are absolutely things you should look at. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate people noticing my shenanigans. Um, our next molecule to implement is a little bit more complicated. So let me know if you have any questions or comments, things that you want to go over here. Our next one is the tweets. Now, just for good coding principles, these probably should have been implemented as the same component to begin with. but as with many websites uh, that I have seen in the wild, they were not implemented, these almost identical pieces of UI, they were implemented as uh, different components, which we're now gonna have to clean up. That's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the tweet implementation uh, and then 
probably just uh, because I don't want to spend more than a few minutes on it, probably just copy and paste the rest or just show you the final states. Um, looking at our design system, I'm going to take suggested content, and copy and paste it into a tweet component. And do the same as always tweets, singular tweets. Not tweet. Okay. Ooh, so this one's going to have a lot of stuff in it. Let's let's take a look and see what actually needs to get implemented. The tweet has the profile photo source. It's got the name. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. Profile photo, name, it's got an area for top content, this little pinned tweet indicator, which isn't always used. It's got username, it's got date, it's got content, it's got an embed, a content preview. It's got retweet, or sorry, comments, retweets. Oh, that icon is wrong. It should be, uh, I don't even remember. Likes, I think, goes there. <laughs> and, and then like this external share button on the side. These three also have counts with them. And it's the exact same for, for this one, just a different content and bad preview and you know, pinned tweet. <laughs> right. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and go to start in that, um, middle tweet. So there is actually a middle area tweet component that already exists. So you know, I'm just going to copy that over. And we also have a middle uh, pinned tweets component, which is almost exactly the same, but it also has this pin area. So actually, I'm going to copy that over as well. Um, and here's a really cool feature in VS Code. If you want to compare two files, you actually can. Uh, command Shift P on Mac or Control Shift P on Windows opens the command palette. And I'm going to use the compare active file with dot 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 command. I have selected on my left the tweet file, and I'm going to compare it with the pinned tweets, which lets me see a view of all the differences between the files, like the diff red green view. We see that um, the left doesn't have class names uh, or the pin icon. The right does have the pin icon and tweet. And the left has slightly different stuff in its content preview. So I'm going to say that the right way to make this tweet component is to uh, have only the common things shared between them and then allow props for the stuff that's different. And that's a really key strategy for design systems, having only the stuff that is shared between all instances of the components be in that component adding variant props for common styles that should be standardized. And then whenever you have content for the component that isn't always there, allow it to be taken in as a prop, such as children. So you want to standardize things like contents, colors within variants, and then allow taking in children props or other props for stuff that's different. So for our tweet component, I'm going to say, set up content preview, we do like um, link.contents, let's say. And then for the top area, let's say that uh, if it's under here, so let's say it's like if we have like um, prefix, then we will add a prefix area. That includes this prefix prop. Prefix is a prop that we take in. So now we can remove CX and class names. I guess we don't need it anymore. Although actually it's really common to still want it because we want to be able to let people specify margins and other important things in class names. So we'll CX that class name prop, which is common for components in a design system. And all right, we have actually extracted out, oh, oops, I was editing the wrong file. <laughs> 
I meant to put it over here. We have extracted out our tweet component. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to, actually, I might have undone too far. Yep. Oh, no, we're good. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to implement it, but I will show you the end result from implementing it. Um, let me just save that. So um, if you want to see the results, it's two components slash molecules tweets.jsx. Um, I ended up, where does this get used? Of course not. Found. Um, I ended up in two molecules making a pinned tweet component and a timeline tweet component that are used in the middle area and not part of the design system, where pinned tweet forwards a bunch of props. It specifies link as um, the link props. It like adds a bit of styling there. And then the prefix is hard coded to this pin icon thing. Whereas the timeline tweet specifies its own stuff for the, the link area. In theory, these probably could have been combined a little bit more um, to have like a generic tweet link content because in theory, either timeline tweet or pin tweet could have the same or link contents as the other, but food for thought for if you want to do this on your own. All right, so that's all I've got on molecules and thus completes the second third of this design system workshop. Um, the last third is going to be split into two categories. First, I'm going to talk a whole bunch about TypeScript, which is a great way for both documenting your components and enforcing that they're used in the proper way. And then I'm going to talk about Storybook, which is a tool that lets you create a lovely interactive web page to visually document, to show off the components. I'm really excited about both those tools, especially TypeScript. I quite like them. Um, but uh, Thank you, Lynn. I do want to shout out, this is a great time if you have any questions in the chat. Um, please do ask them now. Um, great question. Lynn, beyond atoms, do we really need multiple component conventions, molecules, organisms, et cetera, since it seems to just add more cognitive load on deciding what could be a molecule versus organism? It's a great question. And honestly, there's no single answer to it. If you're working on a relatively simpler website, let's say that you are just, oh boy, let me undo my changes so we can actually see things. Let's say that you're working on just this one page. Your website is entirely this page. None of these links actually go anywhere. They just like do stuff in the page. Then you probably don't need to do anything more than molecules. You could just cut off your atomic design at that point. Um, also, if you are on a team or set of teams that isn't super familiar with design systems, it might be hard for them to adopt the entire thing all at once foundations or tokens all the way up through. I don't even, I've never actually been on a team that <laughs> stylized their pages in atomic design. Most teams I've been at cut off at somewhere around organisms, maybe up to templates. Um, also, a lot of sites have a lot of different pages. I'll just show you one of my favorite sites, Codecademy, uh, which is the one that uses Gamut. Um, a lot of these things in Codecademy are part of the design system, but like nowhere else in the site are they used. Like on your Codecademy dashboard, if you use them, the tool, like this is the only place where you have this layout that has like my courses, my goals and so on. So it might not be super valuable for a company like Codecademy that has a lot of different pages to use more than say organisms in their design system. However, um, I would encourage you to, to work with your team to try to figure out when is it worthwhile. If you have a lot of pages in your site, if you have, say, a lot of marketing pages that are similar, and you follow, find yourself falling into repeating the same templates over and over, I would definitely recommend into opting in to that part of atomic design, to templatizing parts of your pages. Um, to answer for, for most teams, though, ones that are just atoms, molecules, maybe organisms, I'd say... I think it is useful, but not imperative that you have a hard delineation between them. Um, it's good to have like nice catchy phrases to help you choose between them. For that, I'd say anytime that you combine multiple 
atoms into something or anytime you have a component that contains an atom, multiple atoms, use a molecule for that. And then same with organisms on molecules. Um, it just helps your team understand that like this, this larger component, the same molecule contains an atom internally. So let me know if that does or doesn't make sense. Uh, the general rule of thumb is if you fall into using something great, otherwise you don't have to. And at the very least for atoms and molecules and organisms, if one contains the other, then try to fall into that next category. Cool. All right. Any other questions on atoms or molecules before we move on to my favorite part of this TypeScript? All right. I will assume that's a no, but we can always go back if y'all need. Let's talk TypeScript. Everything that we've done so far has been in JSX files. And we've seen that the documentation via the editor, so the developer tools experience, has been OK, but not great here. For example, if I wanted to import something from components, sometimes it would work. If I wanted to add a suggested, let's say I wasn't using button yet. If I wanted to add, say, a button here, it might take from components. It might take from somewhere else. If I do add the button from, let's just assume, the right place, doesn't let me know like which props are required, like is size required. Um, if I'm adding like profile photo, it doesn't let me know whether like ordered or size are required props. And also it doesn't know what type the props are supposed to be. Here we see that it's size any, which is the TypeScript term for, it could be anything, I don't know. Fun fact, TypeScript is what powers a lot of the developer tooling for JavaScript and VS Code and other editors. Same with bordered in profile photo. What is it supposed to be? Heck if I know. That's unfortunate. Fortunately, TypeScript provides us with this wonderful way to set things up. And there are a couple steps uh, that we want to do. But first, to, to summarize, TypeScript is a language that adds type, type annotations ways to specify what shapes things are supposed to be to JavaScript. Now, specifically, and more technically speaking, TypeScript is a super set of JavaScript, meaning it includes all the existing JavaScript syntax plus more. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into TypeScript because we, this is a workshop about design systems, not a workshop on TypeScript. So if you really want to deep dive on TypeScript, hit me up on Twitter or uh, elsewhere. I'm sure there's got to be at least one other good talk happening this month or workshop this month on Twitter, or pardon me, on TypeScript. I also, shameless plug, wrote a book called Learning TypeScript. So if you want to uh, learn and you like books, I recommend that. Uh, <laughs> It's a great book, I think. But um, I'll just breeze over some of the configuration that's already set up in this repo um, so that you can get started using TypeScript in this repo if you want. Uh, tsconfig.json, the configuration file for TypeScript projects. Um, it has a few areas that are important. Um, compiler options, specify settings for, or just settings for um, how to read code and output JavaScript. And then include, uh, includes which files we'll look at. There are other parts of the TS config you can add, but they're not needed here. Um, I've just included a few basic compiler options for this workshop. There are actually like over 100 compiler options you can choose from, which is because JavaScript has a lot of different ways to be configured. Um, but fortunately, we don't, we don't need to look at most of them for most projects. Yes, module interop um, tells TypeScript we're in a build system that plays nicely between common JS modules and the script modules. Uh, 
if you if you've never had the pleasure of trying to wrangle JavaScript build systems before and thus had the pain of working with ES modules, consider yourself lucky. Eventually, the whole or most of the ecosystem will be using the new import-export syntax, which we have been using in our files. But unfortunately, today in 2022, fall much of the ecosystem still uses CommonJS internally. So that's a whole can of worms that we won't get into. Uh, JSX, um, how we work with JSX syntax, or that we do in the first place. Um, TypeScript does natively support React, Preact, Solid, and other JSX variants. Here, um, preserve um, says um, let the build system, or let the surrounding build system deal with transpilation. Uh, TypeScript actually does include a, uh, a transpiler. It takes in .ts or .tsx TypeScript files and poops out JavaScript, JS, JSX files. Um, however, we use no emit uh, tells TypeScript not to create uh, JS files alongside sources. Instead, let the surrounding build system deal with it. In fact, if you wanted to, you could do uh, npm run ts or my g TypeScript and then uh, tsc w. Um, I personally like npm ig typescripting um, because it gives me the ability to run tsc, which is a TypeScript compiler, anywhere on my computer without having to install it for project. Um, so if we do tsc w here. Get this nice little real time TypeScript terminal that tells us as we code if there are any issues. We'll also see issues as red squigglies in the editor, but it's a nice little option. Okay, remove that down there. Um, we also have, do, 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 and my uh, indentation is hard. We also have module resolution, um, which is tells TypeScript to use the node, use the node algorithm for resolving where imported stuff comes from. There are other algorithms that it could use, node next in this legacy version. By the way, feel free to ask in the chat if any of these don't make sense. I'm just blazing through them. Um, that, is, that is like the basics or the foundations of our compiler options. We're telling TypeScript that we're working in a surrounding build system that supports JSX and ES modules really nicely, and it's node-based. On top of those, we also have a few more that specifies um, how TypeScript's type checking should work. Uh, skip lib check. Uh, don't make, or don't check node modules for correctness. We don't have to enable skip lib check, but if someone screwed up in our node modules with the TypeScript typings, we, we shouldn't care. Uh, strict says um, enable all the fun, uh, better fun uh, type checking, better fun but optional type checking, um, or type checks for code correctness. TypeScript is very configurable in how strict it is with your code. There are a whole bunch of checks uh, that it can run and by default does not. So if you have a project that you're converting to TypeScript from JavaScript and it has a whole bunch of files and a lot of complex code, you might not want to enable all the strictest options to start. But if you can, it's nice to enable them because they give you better type safety. Some of them are so strict that they're kind of difficult in larger projects and it's okay to not enable them all. Lastly, targets, but uh, DOM APIs, um, native JavaScript, et cetera, APIs are available for use. So if we had said target is like ES5, we wouldn't be able to use like some of the, the like string.replaceAll, for example. But with target ES2020 or later, we do have all sorts of like nice new uh, native JavaScript APIs are available. All right, 
So those are tsconfig options. And if you ever, if you ever get confused, aka.ms slash tsconfig has reference docs for all of these and more for these options and all others. AA.ms is the standard Microsoft um, linker. It's like their bit.ly. So if you go to the TS config reference, you can see all sorts of things at the top. Like I mentioned, there are quite a few of these. Um, so if you're confused, like, oh, what does target do again? You can find target on the page, then go to pound target. And I will post these links uh, in the chat. There you go. Um, these are a little out of date sometimes. Modern browsers support all ES6 features. Well, actually, modern browsers support ES 2020 and ES 2021, but that's okay. Let me just post these docs up. At this point, if I were you, I'd be getting a little impatient to actually start like converting to TypeScript. So let's do that now. Um, I'm going to convert some components over to TypeScript. The first one I'm going to convert over, I have these in my notes, is content preview. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a nice, relatively less complex one. In order to convert a component over from JavaScript to TypeScript, the most important step is to rename the file from JSX to TSX. Boop. And immediately we have um, to subverting components to convert a component, switch its extension from .jsx to .tsx. And immediately we have this red squiggly complaining binding element class name implicitly has an any type. I got to warn you, as much as I love TypeScript, sometimes its error messages are weirdly technical and very confusing. In this case, this is nigh unbeatable. So I would recommend using TS Error Translator, which is this awesome app that someone else, a guy named Matt in the community, wrote that lets, excuse me, lets you copy and paste an error in. And it gives you a nice plain English version of that error. Oh no. Some, oh no, it doesn't have a translation here. Well, in theory, uh, here it works for most errors. I'll just refresh and go back to the initial one. Um, normally, they're actually quite nice as translations. Like if you ever get a conversion of type A to B, Maybe a mistake because error, it'll give you like a nice translation of that, like they're not compatible. So that's unfortunate. Not they used to have this error. Anyway, the reason why is that we have enabled a strict option that says that all attribute, pardon me, all function parameters and variables that can't have their type inferred need a type definition. Now, what does that mean? It means that TypeScript doesn't know what type class name and props are supposed to be. And there's, there's no way for TypeScript to know. Our component doesn't say class name is string or optional string or undefined or anything. Um, and TypeScript isn't going to go through and look at all the places that call content preview because that would defeat the purpose of TypeScript. TypeScript is supposed to check whether those places are correct. And it can't tell whether they're correct until you specify to it what is this parameter supposed to be. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm not going to exhaustively teach you TypeScript. I wish I could, but I don't have the time. So please forgive me for copy and pasting um, this weird bit of syntax here. Um, for the sake of this workshop, you might just have to say, OK, I guess that's how you do it and not go much deeper. Here we are saying that there is a type content preview props, which is the React.anchor HTML elements for an anchor element, meaning this props type, this content preview props, refers to the attributes that you could pass to any anchor element in React. Um, as to why there's a separate namespace for anchor HTML attributes instead of just HTML attributes, um, 
I don't know, but I've seen type errors from not using anchor HTML elements, or part of the anchor HTML attributes. So that's just how we're going to deal with it. But the nice intro to TypeScript equivalent here is that once you have defined a type or an interface for something, you can say colon space and indicate that this prop object here is type content preview props. Now, once you have done that, and these are in uh, three dash documentation, three dash documentation slash a dash TypeScript. Um, then you can search for .tsx files, such as content preview. Um, now TypeScript knows that class name is string or undefined. That little pipe bar that, or union is how TypeScript says it can be either or, either string or undefined. And one fun little editor shenanigan is if you right click and go to definition or command click on something, it'll take you all the way to where TypeScript uh, understands that type, where that type is defined. And this lovely giant list of things is the HTML attributes interface, which defines all the types available to all HTML elements. Um, interestingly, in React specifically, they've defined default checked and default value for all elements. I don't know why that's the case. That seems wrong to me. Like an anchor shouldn't have default checked in it. That's weird. But, uh, otherwise, the standard HTML attributes common to all elements are things like class name, content editable, hidden, and so forth. Cool. Now, again, I, I know I'm going through kind of quickly, but please let me know if there's anything that just like makes no sense and you can't continue it with without understanding. One thing you might have just seen there is that now we get actually much nicer auto completion as we start typing in props. It's a nice little documentation piece. Like as I start typing in class or CLA, I get all the props that have CLA in their name. So like class name, since we already have class name, it's not suggesting it. So like, let me do class name, here we go. Last name equals, and then React will, or pardon me, TypeScript will even suggest, hey, it's, I know it's a string. Did you mean to write a string there? That's a nice little feature. So a couple, couple things to note here. Um, one is that um, I have a DTS file, a types file checked into the repo. I'm just going to delete its contents for a hot moment. Um, by default, TypeScript does not understand uh, framework or build system specifics that aren't native to JavaScript. Therefore, it does not understand the concept of CSS modules. CSS modules is a standard, but it's not part of the JavaScript standard. It's not part of the DOM standard. It's just some community thing that we shenaniganed up at some point in time and have been going with ever since. And there are actually small discrepancies between how different build systems work with CSS modules, little edge cases. So TypeScript does not natively understand them. That's why by default, if you create a new TypeScript project or migrate a project to TypeScript that was just JavaScript and use CSS modules and don't do anything specific to them, TypeScript will give you this unhappy thing. You cannot find module dot slash index dot module dot CSS or its corresponding type declarations. Actually, I'm curious, will the error translator app? Oh, oh no, did I lose? Error translator have this? Yes. The translation here, well, there's no explanation yet, so I encourage you to find this on GitHub if you Google it. Um, <laughs> this could be one of two things. Either CSS couldn't be, it doesn't exist on your file system, or I can't find any type declarations for it. Um, by type declarations, what we mean is you need to declare in your type system how these .module.css things work. That's in type of to declare module star dot module that CSS. So whenever I see star dot module CSS, what I actually have are these contents, which styles is a record. So object that has string keys and string values here that is export defaulted. All right. And now TypeScript no longer has red squigglies. And if we right click, go to definition on styles.content preview, 
Oh, whoop, not found. Does this work? Here we go. We right click on styles, and then we get taken to styles. Recognize style.module.css files use a declare module. All right. The second thing to go over is uh, by default, TypeScript also does not understand um, foreign modules or packages into known modules. And just to show how this would look, I'm going to npm install the package that has filled in our understanding of the class names package. And I'm going to do the restart ts server command. Now I'm guessing oh, it's still installed. So types class names. Here we go. Come on, type shit. I'm trying to get a red squiggly here, but it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, not cooperating with me here. Um, let me. I'm going to go ahead and just delete. Here we go. All right. So if you similar to how TypeScript doesn't understand CSS modules, it also doesn't understand some JavaScript packages. Um, just having a JavaScript package that has a bunch of JavaScripts.js or similar in it isn't enough type information for TypeScript to understand. So TypeScript will uh, give you a complaint when you have the strictest mode enabled saying, hey, I don't know what this is. Uh, it's type any, meaning it could be anything. So we hover over CX, we just get import CX. We don't, we don't actually know what type it is. If we hover over its variable, we just we get no information. Some packages include .d.ts or declaration files that set things up for them. Like if you have a TypeScript package that's written in TypeScript, you can export DTS files, which are created by TSC. If you don't, then you can go to aka.ms slash types to see if the community has built a package for you. What's that in the chat? And then you can search for whatever package you need. Let's say class names. Um, and then, oh, PIL class names comes with its own types now. Huh, it used to be an at types package. Well, <laughs> React does not come with its own types of types. It's actually written in the only major competitor to React, Flow, which most mostly is not used in open source anymore. Uh, so you have to install a package with the at types prefix that contains the types for it. So npmi at types react. Uh, and then I'm going to save that as a dev dependency. Go ahead and reinstall class names. So to recognize packages that don't ship with ETS files, install and types package. Tip search on aka.ms slash tips. All right, let's add those docs here. But now just to give you some actual use here, uh, native three star. Uh, I'm going to show that now that we have declared our content preview, oops, content preview components um, as a uh, as a TypeScript component, we can in files that use it get a lot better developer IntelliSense for how it's supposed to work. I'm just going to copy it out in this tweet component, which is also converted to TypeScript. Um, so if we start typing content preview. Similar to how you saw in Content Preview, we get really nice auto-completion for the names of things. Style that link. Then href equals URL. And let's give it uh, link.contents as children. Here you go. So that's what we had before. So that's how a very foundational basic component works in TypeScript. Uh, we declare what the types that it takes in are, and then TypeScript can inform us as we use it what are the actual prop types that we're supposed to be able to use, which is really awesome when you have a type system, sorry, with a design system, uh, especially if you're onboarding new developers and they don't quite know what the required props are and they don't 
have the time or ability to read through really complex components like molecules and organisms. All right. Let me know in the chat if there are any questions y'all have that you want to ask. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. The next thing I want to convert to TypeScript is link. Uh, link is basically the same thing as what we saw before. Um, it just uses react.html attributes. Again, I don't know why some of them have their own object under react, some don't, it's, who knows. So link props equals HTML attributes of HTML anchor elements, and then no part of HTML anchor attributes. Anchor, there we go, anchor HTML attributes. Cool. Not much new there. Next up, we're going to go to suggested content. And I'm going to convert this over to TSX. Oh, suggested content is the first uh, one that has its own prop definitions, its own stuff. This heading thing is not DOM. Um, to define. Um, to define a custom object shape, use an interface. Um, children, uh, it might be needed to be declared explicitly on it. So if we do interface suggested content props, um, we have three red squigglies here already. We need to define children, class name, and heading. Well, children, class name, actually come from this the, the native DOM props, so we don't really need to define our own there. Um, we can just say extend react.html attributes, html div elements. That fixes uh, most of them, but then we still need to know what headings type is. Um, heading, we could declare it as a string, that would allow any string content for the heading. And in fact, when we look in the usage for our right column component, we do see that heading tends to be a string. So that's one thing we could call it. However, I would suggest if you ever have something that needs to be, um, needs to be a string or really can be any other React content, like maybe it should be like, you might like, which is a span, and then there's like a div. Oops, I messed up that syntax, something horrible. Uh, and then maybe there's like, uh, I don't know, like a soup yay in there, like something like this. Um, string doesn't cut it. If we type this as a string, then we would get this angry, oh boy. Um, Oops, I need to exit on that interface. Um, we would get like this angry little message, pardon me as I mess around in different files, angry little message saying like, hey, um, heading, oh no, why is it not complaining? Well, anyway, we might get an angry message saying like, hey, you passed in JSX attributes or elements instead of our React node. So whenever you have something that could be a, any sort of React node, be it a string or a null or like actual JSX, then use the react.react .react node type. This is the type for any allowed React, React child, string, null, JSX elements. Cool. So let me just push those docs up. All right, blazing through here, let's go to profile photo. All right, um, I'm gonna rename this to TSX. I'm gonna do the same interface here. Profile photo props. By the way, I've seen some people call things just props in each file, and I would not recommend that because you have a bajillion things that are called props 
And if you ever have to import and export those interfaces, like to reuse them between files, the way I am with these React attributes, it gets annoying to rename them. So use, use the fully qualified name, profile photo props. This one extends react.image HTML attributes of HTML image element. And it also adds bordered, which is an optional Boolean, and size. Now, when I say bordered is an optional Boolean, what I mean is we don't need to pass in a bordered prop. Not everyone wants to specify bordered equals false, which is why I've added this nice little question mark here. The question mark says, folks who pass in profile photo props don't need to specify a bordered one. So if we look in native zero starts for uh, profile photo, and we look at the right nav, we see there's no border here, but there are other props. And now this size prop is a little more tricky to, to type out. In actuality, we know that size should be a string, so we could type size string. However, we get this complaint here Element implicitly has type any because expression of type string can't be used to index type small string, medium string, large string. This is one of the more common and also one of the, at first, more confusing TypeScript errors you might get. What TypeScript is trying to tell you here is that you have declared that the size prop can be any string in the universe. That's what string means, any string, empty string, string with 15 emoji flowers, small, medium, large, whatever. But TypeScript knows that the sizes object only has these three possible keys, small, medium, large. How unfortunate. Thus, TypeScript is telling you you might have an error, or you might try to be accessing a member of an object and that member doesn't exist. So what you should do is use a union type, saying something like small or medium or large, saying, um, Size is not just any old string. It can be only specifically one of these three possible strings. Now we don't have a red squiggly, and size is known to be small or medium or large specifically. Great. It's also required, as in we don't have this question mark there. However, there is one cute little thing I like to show off. You can do size geo type of sizes. If you had like 50 bajillion more sizes in there, it would be really annoying to type them all out manually. So this type of operator in the type system, although it looks like the type of runtime operator, it's actually completely separate. It tells TypeScript, give me back the type of whatever this object is. So in this case, it would give you back the concept of an object type that has small, medium, and large properties. And then the key of operator in the type system says, Given that type, give me back all the keys on it. So here we see that size is the same as what we typed out manually, small or medium or large. And this is going to be really common if you end up implementing a design system similar to this one, where you have small, medium, large, or other string literal keys that are based on objects. If you had gone with the CSS uh, direct strategy, like of just going styles of size, then you would have to use small or medium or large manually. So another point I think in favor of using an object. Anyway, um, one more little note here, TypeScript, the language service that VS Code uses to power all these nice little hovers has a lot of like cute little utilities or actions, code actions you can take. One of which is extract to type alias Boop, which I just clicked on the yellow light bulb, gives you a new type, so an alias. And I'm going to call that a profile photo size. I'm also going to export it in case someone else wants to refer to it. And I really like this because it gives you a nice name for your types. Uh, you're not just saying, I don't know, like this key of type of thing. Like that's kind of confusing. Now, if we read this interface, it's like an, a nice label for it. You don't have to do it, but I, I kind of prefer that way. All right. Boop. Um, that's pretty much um, 
all the content that I had for the TypeScript stuff. Um, so before we move on to Storybook, which I'll spend the last 15 or 20 minutes or so going over before leaving 10 or so minutes at the end for questions. I don't know, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, uh, some of those types of error messages trigger PTSD, yeah. TypeScript is an awesome tool, um, but it is also the first of its kind to become popular in JavaScript land, meaning it's the first popular strict superset of JavaScript that's like hit mainstream adoption. I know if any of you use like reason slash rescript or closure script or similar, you're probably like getting mad at me now saying, no, we've had these forever, but like TypeScript is the first really popular version. So it is learning the hard way, all the things that really pain people. And one of those is that error messages are really, really hard in this type of language. Like it, you need to work on them. So the TypeScript team is always accepting feedback. Um, I highly encourage you, if there's a TypeScript error message that you hate, definitely go on the TS error translator, uh, contribute an explanation or translation if they don't exist, uh, which I might be doing later if I have time for this particular one. Um, and then if you really feel up for it, the Microsoft TypeScript uh, issues tracker, uh, the TypeScript repo, because fun fact, the language is completely open source. It uh, does have an issue template for, um, let's see, feature requests and bugs. So please do, please do file things in the issue tracker as, as you find them, if you see any bugs there. I gotta say, uh, TypeScript is one of my favorite things, but I definitely agree that the error messages leave something to be desired. Anyway, that's all for TypeScript. Um, let's move on to the last part of this workshop, Storybook. Storybook is awesome. I, I really like it. Uh, it's one of my favorite things, but I will say it can be a little bit of a pain to set up. So I'm gonna glaze over that part a little bit. Um, but Storybook is a tool that generates an interactive docs website for your components. It is highly configurable and can um, and, and can use plugins to read in your source code and auto generates much of those docs sites for you. Um, the command that I ran previously on this repo to generate the storybook setup in the repo is this one, but you don't have to run that. Um, I previously ran this command and then applied some customizations, which we'll go over. Uh, but to start, uh, you can just do mkm run storybook to get it running locally. Get it working locally. Uh, so actually, I'll just put this here. Shell and you run storybook. Oh no! Oh, it's a <sighs> some npm patches don't yet support and uh, node eighteen. Use node sixteen for this. If you use uh, NVM, there is an NVM RC, so you can use NVM use, such as with NVM use. If you want to specify a version manually, you can use like MVM use 16 or whatever. MVM use 14 should work too. And MPM run storybook. And wait a little bit. Oh boy, here we go. And angry messages in the console. I think they're just warnings. Ooh, look at that fun VS Code bug. Isn't that, isn't that nifty? <laughs> there we go. All right. Oh, anyway, localhost 6006 should open automatically. It only took five to 10 seconds. So that's not so terrible. I'm going to clear the terminal to see if it still poops out those error messages. Here we go. So this is Storybook. You can configure a nice home page. In fact, you might have seen from the icon the gamut site that we looked at earlier is also using Storybook. But um, here are, oh no, it's broke. 
What broke with it? It was working. Uh, oh, right, right, right. So if you get this error, sorry, I did prepare for this. <laughs> you install least build on another platform than the one you're currently using. This won't work. Um, so tip, if you get this error, um, if you get um, error, you build on another platform, uh, RM, RF node, modules, and uh, npm install. And I left this in the workshop because I have seen this so many times. <laughs> it's been me and so many other people. npm i, uh, npm run storybook. But anyway, let me show you what like a full complete storybook setup can look like. Um, let's look at the car card. Yeah, yeah, card components from Gamut. Um, you have these wonderful uh, props down here that you can configure. For example, if you want to play around with the children, I just typed in a whole bunch of gibberish and it took a little bit, but that's what the card looks like. And then you can switch variants to say like navy or yellow. And a lot of this is auto-generated from the code. We see that it can document the description um, of the, the prop, which is auto-filled when you use TypeScript and a certain TypeScript plugin from the TypeScript props. Um, let's, let's add a medium shadow. Ooh, look at that. Very snazzy. Thank you, Codecademy. Just going to check in. NPM install. Ooh, still running. This is the ecosystem we have chosen for ourselves, folks. All right. Building now. Come on, storybook. Loading. Yes. Oh, phew. Curse of the demo. All right. So this is a much more simple storybook, which shows off just the stuff that we've set up. Um, what I've done is I've set up the uh, storybook uh, doc gen plugin. Um, in the storybook settings, so React, Docker, and TypeScript, which means that it will generate these controls based off the TypeScript props. So if we see profile photo index TSX, uh, the props that it has are border, size, and source. And then um, these just auto magically get populated in the component. And you can play around with it, changing the size medium, large, tiny, small. Ordered true. There we go. So the way that a story is set up uh, is one of two possible formats. There is an MDX format and a stories.javascript format. Um, the stories.mdx format is the one that I kind of personally prefer, but the like more legacy, like traditional format is stories.jsx or tsx. So I'm going to look at that one first. I'm going to go to that specific story, button story. Now this JSX file looks and feels just like any other JavaScript React file that you might use in your React app. It's got the import from components, and it's got some exports. And uh, the nice storybook auto templating magic gave us some links to nice storybook docs for us if you want to read more. In this format, the export default object contains, among a plethora of other options, args, component, and title, where component is the actual component being rendered, what goes in the canvas here. The title is the title that we put in the sidebar button, yay. And the args are the default props to pass in. And these get merged down with the args to find the props defined on the component. Um, so here we have args color starts off as primary, and Storybook is able to read in our TypeScript type to know that secondary is the other option, which I've been kind of glossing over before, but I really want to emphasize how superbly cool it is that Storybook is able to read in the TypeScript types for a component to auto-generate a docs website for it. Like, that is mind-blowing to me. And in more advanced setups, it can even like 
tell you aliases like theme or CSS object, or just like put in the union of string literal types there. Like if you have a description, like that to me is just mind blowing. So I think this is really cool. <laughs> um, and then in ours, we can also play around with the children in the button. Oops. Hooray, click me, place. That's really cool stuff. Um, the story also can have multiple different variants. So like I just called it story 